Equity markets over last three years have attracted lakhs of new investors. But after the correction of last 18 months now, how many can say that they have actually made good returns? When investors come to PMS AIF world, the aim and endeavor is not just good returns, but wealth creation. What does that mean and how does that happen? This is the context of our first panel discussion today. So beginning with the first panel discussion of the day, 10x returns aspired by many, achieved by few. How to aim this over the next 10 years? Let me quickly introduce you to the panelists. Mr. Dheeraj Sachdev is the managing partner and CIO at Roha Asset Managers, formerly a senior fund manager at HSBC Global Asset Management, he was ranked among India's best fund managers by the Outlook Business and Value Research in the year 2017. Our second panelist, Mr. Anil Rego, is the CIO and founder of Right Horizons Group. Mr. Anil is a pioneer in the contrarian style of investing and a seasoned investor for over three decades. He brings in his experience of market cycles and believes in delivering superior risk-adjusted returns through a disciplined investment process. Our third panelist is Mr. Anur Anirudh Garg. He's the managing partner and fund manager at Invasit. He's a chartered accountant with a Bachelor of Business Studies from Shaheed Sukhdev College of Business Studies, Delhi University, and Master of Investment Management from ICMA Center, United Kingdom. This panel will be moderated by Ms. Ritika Pharma. She is director, EVP, and part of core founding team at PMS AIF World. Ritika is a highly progressive and performance-oriented individual and carries more than a decade of experience in investment advisory and private wealth management. Ritika believes that best returns are not made by making best purchases, rather by making informed investment decisions. Now, a little bit about Ritika's educational front. She is a commerce and economic graduate from Delhi University and holds financial planning and wealth management degree from the Indian Institute of Financial Planning and Wealth Management, as well as many other investments related certifications as stipulated by regulations from time to time. Over to you, Ms. Pharma. Thank you so much, Akriti. Um, a very warm welcome to Dheeraj, Anil, and Anirodh. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. So let's start the session by put, uh, putting across a very important Warren Buffett quote on investing, which says, if you're not willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. Owning a quality, owning a portfolio of quality businesses and holding it for eight to 10 years actually help investors build eight to 10 times. It is indeed a dream return for every investor. Let's engage with our group of panelists today and demystify the ways to make 10 times in 10 years. So starting with you, Dheeraj, there's always a debate uh, that mutual funds are over diversified and PMSs are concentrated in nature. And this maybe makes PMSs as a mu uh, much riskier structure, but at the same time, very, very conducive for long-term wealth creation. Is it true that owning a highly concentrated portfolio or maybe a moderate concentrated portfolio is important for aiming 10 times in 10 years? Yeah, hi, good afternoon to everyone. Uh Okay, uh, see, there is a, it's a myth that PMS is concentrated and mutual funds are diversified. In fact, we also run a PMS portfolio, which is fairly diversified. And uh, I mean, there is no color of money, whether it is in the mutual fund platform or the PMS platform. Ultimately, it depends upon the style of investing by the respective fund manager. Now, if one looks at the historical portfolios of major investors worldwide to answer your question in specific, which is either concentrated or diversified, uh, one finds that there is no simple answer to having either a concentrated or diversified portfolio for superior returns. Uh, there is a saying in investment world, do not put all your eggs in one basket. One should diversify. Now, when, if you look at the historical portfolios, I mean, poor Peter Lynch, uh, the famous US stock investor, never saw a stock he didn't like and was a great proponent of portfolio diversification. Now, while managing the Fidelity Magellan Fund itself, 
at the peak of uh, uh, his career, Lynch's portfolio had more than 1,000 stocks and he generated superior compounded returns for decades. On the other hand, there are several other great investors uh, spread across geographies who have very concentrated portfolios like Warren Buffett or George Soros. Uh, they are renowned proponents of portfolio concentration. I mean, to Buffett, over diversification presented a low hazard, low return situation, and thus he dismissed the idea of too much diversification. So concentrated portfolio pivots on the absolute conviction of the investor. A diversified portfolio, on the other hand, works well if the investor is optimistic about the stock, but wary of the associated risk. So as time goes by in the investment journey of an investor, the right method is to put fairly large sums into companies which one knows about fairly well and in the management of which one thoroughly believes. Avoid diversification when investors do not understand the company's business or its value. Finally, I would like to say that if I'm in the, I'm in the camp to have a portfolio with diversification, where weightage of more predictable quality business that has historical pedigree should be at least say four to 10% of the portfolio weight, while one can take exposure to early stage or smaller companies without diluting their quality parameters at say two to 3% weight. This will enable an investor to take exposure to out of favor or smaller or early stage companies uh, that has solid potential without commensurate degree of risk uh, by having a small weight in the portfolio. Because you never know which company will make it big over time. So it's important to have a small tail of such small companies in the portfolio. A few of these companies can give outsized returns or sub superior alpha returns over a period of time. So let's say a typical diversified portfolio comprises of 20 to 35 stocks, but the real returns are actually generated by no more than three to four companies. And the weightage of these stocks can eventually become a majority of that portfolio. Sure, thank you. Uh, how about you, Anil? What do you have to you know, say about this? Yeah, so I think it also has to do with, you know, uh, just looking at the basic uh, topic that we have, right, is, uh, 10, 10 x returns in 10 years yeah. uh, and and the, the question is what does that mean right uh, that means a 25.89 percent return okay and and the question is now can we achieve this 25.89 percent return consistently over a 10 year period right so uh, so so the question is is it wishful is it practical uh, I think yes uh, definitely it is difficult but I think it's not impossible Right? Because at least I have seen uh, there are some cases where in, you know we have seen in periods 25.89 percent type of return uh, for over a decade out there. Okay, but an investor also I think needs to understand you know what he's getting in for because uh, if you want that type of outsized return, uh, I don't think you can invest in large cap stocks and think that you can get that return. And right? so so you have to work on, let's say, small cap stocks and mid cap stocks. Uh, the second is maybe you have to look at uh, names which are undiscovered. Uh, you may also have to take concentrated bets. Now, what does all of this mean? Uh, this means that, okay, you're taking a higher level of risk, right? And, and I think investors also need to ask themselves, is this right for you? You know, are you willing to take this level of risk? Because a lot of the time, you know, uh, one gets into it thinking, yes, I want the best return. I want 25% return. But then when you see the volatility that's associated with it, you know, are you willing to stomach it? Okay, because it in small caps, it's not unusual to see, let's say, indices down 25% many times, right? And in extremes, it can go down as much as 60%, right? So if you have 100 rupees, it means it has gone down to, you know, something like 40 rupees. Are you willing to stomach that? Right. So, so I think it's about the appetite one has and whether one wants to take that type of risk is every investor should sort of look into it. And I think what maybe a practical way to do it is to say for a part of a portfolio, maybe I will do that. Right. I will look for taking this, you know, higher risk. I will look at making concentrated bets and this part of it, I will, you know, sleep over it. Right. Over maybe a longer period of time. And, and uh, I think that's the best way. So in summary, maybe I would think that, yes, uh, something like this is possible, but okay, you need to know the associated risks. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Anil. So moving on to Anirudh. Anirudh, my next question is to you. Uh, in the hindsight, one can say, you know, many things about multi-baggers, but yeah. since Quant style of investing and your portfolio is largely a Quant 
uh, you know, style of an investment. So uh, that's a that's a style of investment wherein investment decisions are based on, uh, you know, on the basis of an empirical evidence. Do you believe that quant style of investing can actually help identify, pick multi-baggers or uh, such uh, mid and small stage businesses at a very, very early age? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so first of all, I would like to wish all the viewers uh, a very good afternoon. Thank you for giving us your time. Uh, Ritika, what I believe is that um, one has to agree that human resource for any fund house is limited. So if Invasit had not been doing quant, we would have analyzed maximum 100, 200 companies at max. And we are looking to generate alpha. So we are joking, looking to generate considerable alpha, say a 12 to 14% alpha per year for the next 10 years. So what we want here is we, are, we want the future leaders. So those future leaders, I believe, are not there in that 200 list that one compiles for oneself, uh, looking at the market, market circumstances and the uh, recency bias. So uh, what we believe is that uh, one should uh, have a quant system where in Invasset, we analyze 1,700 plus companies on a real-time basis. This is where we get all those companies which will be the next multi-baggers and will make it up to that 200 list going forward. What we have seen in 30 years of our uh, back-tested data and seven years of our uh, uh, on-ground work is that Quant recognizes companies at a very nascent phase. These companies are not, uh, I would say, very well uh, studied in the market, there are no research reports about them. We have to work really hard, uh, uh, burn our eyes. And uh, many of the, those companies that we have bought in the past, no information was available for them. But they turned out to be very big, great multi-baggers, Loris Labs, for example. And uh, what I've seen is going forward as the story develops, as the price moves up, as the profits kick in, these becomes the darling, they become the darling of the investment world. So, uh, I believe, yes, Quant has an ability to predict uh, what companies will uh, be the multi-baggers and pick them at an early phase. Also, I believe, Ritika, that Quant gives you an advantage to analyze exuberance. So when these companies, they, when they were not, they, they become multi-baggers when they were not looked by the industry. But when these companies are looked by everyone and there are abundance of reports available for them, uh, Quant gives you an uh, edge by just exiting them at a better price. So in uh, June 2020, uh, we bought Loris Labs. And in June 2021, when we shifted uh, our uh, criteria from uh, generation of alpha to preservation of alpha, we had to exit the companies. So uh, in the process, we had sold the company 5x. So the, I believe that two advantages of Quant are always there. First of all is you analyze a wider uh, sample set and secondly uh, you get uh, a lot of advantage from the behavioral nuances that are there that font is able to uh, numerify sure sure thank you thanks thanks for the response Anirudh. so uh, moving on uh, my next question is to Dheeraj and to Anil per se because your portfolios are more inclined towards mid and small caps right? or maybe even a bit of it towards micro caps as well so starting with you Dheeraj first what do you think are the ways to identify or evaluate a business today that actually helps that actually has the potential to generate eight to ten times over ten years I mean based on your experience what do you think are the important attributes that you will look at identifying potential multi-baggers today yeah, I think thanks for that question. Uh, so we keep it simple. There's a fundamental approach to investing. Now, as you pointed out, I mean, I think achieving eight to 10 times returns in the stock market over a 10 year period is a challenging goal and a significant achievement, but one has to achieve it with patience, discipline and proper research. There has to be a clear long term focus on stocks uh, uh, as, the, as the stocks can be volatile in the short term but have historically produced good returns over the longer term time period. Now, the approach to invest has to be um, in scalable growth-oriented businesses that have large market size of opportunity. So a disabled market size has to be big enough for a company to grow on a sustained basis time after time. This ideally should be, as I pointed out earlier, it should be the starting point. Besides other parameters for uh, stock selection uh, or the approach should include buying capital efficient and cash flow generating companies 
that can fund their growth capex largely out of internal approvals without any major dilution of equity or resorting to borrowed capital so self sustaining self sustaining i again repeat business model is another important factor for stock selection the other evaluation is to invest in predictable businesses with sustainable competitive advantage or barriers to entry and are available at reasonable valuations so this will enable superior returns through sheer power of compounding by simply staying with quality companies in their journey of growth of course one needs to monitor their progress and also exit if they become too exotically pricey in times of in terms of valuations sure how about you anil what do you think are the potential uh, the key attributes that you would look for in any business before adding it to your portfolio yes yeah, so uh, like i said earlier i think one of the key factors you know looking at uh, you know the small cap or the mid cap segment out there uh, in fact we have one of our funds uh, maybe right horizon minerva underserved which uh, is managed by pu sharma and uh, he runs it in a focused way and i'll i'll use that as a bit of an example uh, and you know if somebody wants to build a portfolio that's also what you know they can sort of look at okay so so the, i think the first thing towards achieving outsized returns is you know uh, to start looking at the underlying stocks right because uh, it's not about you know saying okay i want to achieve this it gets down to actually going back and managing at a stock level uh, researching them uh, in fact uh, we do channel checks you do ground checks okay before actually you know investing into them even after doing you know your modeling and all of it uh, and uh, at least we like to look at you know the earnings growth of companies okay so uh, while looking at the price right because uh, if if you buy something which is a little higher priced you may not get that appreciation uh, you need to sort of search for names which are a little undiscovered okay and and also you know uh, have to take some concentrated bets okay which is uh one aspect to it you know is is you know looking at the risk side because uh while you look at returns and you look for ones which gives you outside returns uh, what could happen is you may have some accidents on the way and those accidents may be very difficult to overcome because it pulls down your you know return on your portfolio and then recovering from that sort of becomes uh, you know uh, a big issue and it may just eat into your returns uh, in the long term right and and we are talking about continuing to maintain a very high almost like a 26% uh, per annum type of return over you know a long period of time so so i think it it's it's about looking at value looking at ones which are sort of undiscovered uh, doing a deep dive uh, into each company level you know uh, what are their uh, usps you know what are the uh, tailwinds that they see uh are there you know uh, some segments of the market which have not yet get got discovered and that is sort of going to strategically do well uh and all of them sort of come together and and then it makes sense to have you know a set of stocks uh you know have allocation by your conviction uh and and i think that's that's how one sort of ends up you know making uh, this type of uh, return especially on the small cap side sure sure so in continuation to your response uh, anil uh, i think uh, you are running a pms by the name of right horizons minerva underserved pms right yeah. now this pms has done phenomenally well and has generated close to about 9% 19% cada over last 10 years and an alpha of approximately 5% over the bse small cap but it is still not a 10 times return right this adds to maybe close to about 6 to 7 times so where do you think that there was a miss you know and what do you think is the expectation from uh, you know expectation in future from this pms yeah first of all i i'm not sure i can call it a miss because maybe it's among the top 3 you know pms is all india so and it has done very well for itself i think what it also says is it's it's how difficult it is right that 26% okay and uh, maybe if if you ask me what is it could it have been and or when could it be let me put it that way i think uh, it is also to do with the environment right so if you went back and saw the previous decade was not necessarily the best performing decade right so and and uh, you, you know you had covid you know you you saw uh, a number of uh, things happen out there uh, markets also uh, you know the earlier decade 
you know, the early governments, etc., had its own uh, fair share of issues, right? So, uh, so, so, I, so I think it's also to do with that environment where we also were in a bit of a deleveraging cycle. The environment was tight. Uh, in the earlier part, you know, the interest rates were also very high. You know, so inflation was high. So, so I think there were factors which you know one didn't have it. Of course, I am reasonably bullish going forward because one key criteria is that I think interest rates have come up for India, and uh, you know I, I believe the deleveraging cycle is also over. So you know I think that this decade, hopefully, we should be able to see at a broader level as well higher percentage returns, both at an aggregate as well as when you look at you know uh, some of the niche strategies like this. Uh, in a good environment, you can definitely see much better. But yes, I think there's also, you know, what are those learnings that one can sort of take back? Uh, are there any, you know, studying, you know, which are ones which didn't do as well, uh, you know, and look at it. But but yes, in small caps, it also takes some time for unlocking of value to happen. Sure, sure, sure. So um, moving on to Anirudh. Anirudh, I will have my next sort of question to you. Um, you know, if I, and I think this is the most realistic question, because till now we've been talking about mid, small and micro caps, because Dheeraj and Anil are more from the mid and small cap fund management style, right? But your is like a, a no market cap bias. So maybe this question, uh, you know, kind of suits you well. Um, so, you know, of late, we've seen that in the last few years, uh, a lot of fund managers coming and talking about owning consistent compounding stocks. And that can actually help them earn or generate maybe eight to time ten, eight to ten times in next few years, right? Maybe next eight to ten years. And these cons consistent compounding businesses are maybe moated, well-established, large-sized businesses. To maybe name a few, like a Bajaj Finance or an Asian Paints. So I would like to ask you to kind of share your views in this regard. That is it possible for a concentrated large cap portfolio or a large cap bias portfolio to generate maybe eight to ten times in the next ten years? Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, let's look at from a macro point of view. So we at Invasive believe that if there are no uh, major geopolitical events happening, India with all the demography and all the reforms in place should grow at say seven to 8%. And Indian markets should grow at 12 to 14%. What we are looking at this seminar is a 26%. So a 12% alpha. See, to generate this 12% alpha, I believe that it would not be just generating the alpha, but I think preservation of the alpha is also very, very important. So that is why our approach is not, uh, uh, I would say, uh, biased towards mid caps, small caps, or large caps. What we do at IED is we start when there is a uh, market capitulation. Whenever there is market capitulation, as it happened in uh, 2020 of June, or uh, uh, maybe uh, July of 2022, we start from small caps. And then as the market moves forward, we shift our focus from small to mid to large to ultra large, thereby reducing our beta, reducing our risk. So what I believe is uh, every approach should have this element where as the markets get expensive, preservation of capital should be given utmost priority because alpha is something that if you generate and you lose it, the purpose is defeated. So I think it has to be a combination of both. And... Um, Answering the second part of your question, where you said that uh, about Asian banks and Bajaj finances and uh, well moted companies like these, uh, we believe that uh, they enter uh, our portfolio in the stage three, where we feel that the markets are expensive. So uh, just buying these companies and keeping them from 10 years, we believe that that uh, alpha would not be created because they have run up very, uh, they've run up a lot in the last decade. And uh, the next decade, I think they are not going to be that big outperformers as they were in the last, owing to the change in the credit cycle, the change in the commodity cycle, and the change in the interest rate cycle. Sure. So which sectors do you think, or uh, you know, what kind of stocks do you think will be uh, uh, the next multi-bagger, say, in this decade that will actually rule uh, this decade or maybe uh, you know be the potential multi-baggers. So what do you think, uh, Anirudh? I think it'll be more uh, 
to do with uh, the credit cycle. So I think Indian banks, especially public sector banks and corporate banks like ICICI and XS should lead the way. And uh, there's a lot of value unlocking that has to be done here. And uh, there's going to be a huge uh, growth in the ROAs of the banks, I believe, going forward. And uh, manufacturing, I believe, should also uh, take the lead. Apart from that, we also believe that government companies, which had been neglected in the last decade, uh, though, though I, uh, I think there is some catching up which has to be done uh, in these companies because they have immense asset base and immense opportunity that India presents. Uh, so all these companies, I believe, should be the leaders for the next decade. Sure. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Dheeraj? What do you think, uh, you know, which all sectors will be the key dominant ones, you know, uh, over a period of next five, seven, ten years or which will this decade? So, Ritika, in terms of sectors, we firmly believe that India's time for manufacturing sector has come and there will be significant rise of India's manufacturing. I mean, Indian manufacturing will move from the services sectors poor cousin and will certainly try to match it. I mean, the key drivers are already seeded in place, whether it is a PLI scheme from the government in 14 sectors with emphasis on Atma Nirbhar Bharat along with reduction in tax rates for new, unit, new units actually being set up. Uh, these along with China plus one strategy, I mean, where they're looking at supply alternatives to China have provided the right uh, enablers for potentially strong manufacturing growth uh, in the years ahead. So many companies either in the manufacturing uh, or its ecosystem uh, will do well. I mean, these include engineering and capital goods companies, chemicals, pharma, auto components, electronics and semiconductor businesses. And they're likely to become much bigger uh, sectors over the next five to 10 years. But besides uh, themes like banking and financial services, which has already been talked about by Anil, I mean, India being a capital starved economy will continue to be a compounding business. One needs to be selective here as companies have differentiated business model. So overall banking and financial services sector will sustain improved performance uh, with higher credit growth, uh, stable net interest margins and, and low credit cost and better returns on assets. Finally, given India's urbanization, which is quite low by global standards uh, and the formalization of our economy is being witnessed, tremendous acceleration in, uh, is happening there and we believe there are opportunities in consumer categories like uh, retail, travel, and housing sectors. Sure. Anil, uh, what do you think uh, will be the next key dominant sectors, you know, ruling this decade? It's interesting. I think that all of us have reasonably conversed on the same, you know, themes and sectors out there. Okay. Uh, definitely for us as well. I think this is also a decade that, uh, you know, manufacturing will uh, rule the roost. Uh, services has done really well for India, but, but I think uh, hats off to the government on starting off some of the, you know, Make in India campaigns and the branding that came with it, I think was opportune uh, so that when some of the other factors played out, like, you know, people looking for alternatives to China, uh, as well as, you know, uh, you know, today even Europe as well, supply chain disruptions, etc., Right, so so that that is definitely something that I think the manufacturing uh, sector is going to do well, uh, and that can be you know I think broad based across the board. I think right from uh, automobile automo automobile components to uh, uh, specialty chemicals, etc. You know, so I think there are a lot of niches that one needs to find out, uh, especially into companies which I think are uh, delivering uh, niche areas. Uh, having a good competitive advantage and, you know, uh, continuing to maintain and maintain some sort of dominance over it. Uh, so, so those are uh, sectors that I think will do well. Uh, yes, the banking sector, I think the PSU banks also uh, has sort of, you know, I think will come off age, the NPA's uh, crisis is behind it, I think will definitely, you know, help and support. Yes, and the third is, uh, I think coming from a, uh, India has always been a consumer market and consumer oriented. Okay, so and 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 if you go back and see financials and consumer actually is a very large part of the Indian market. I think that will sort of continue to be there. But but I, but I think if there's a lot more to go into, right, into the detailing and almost like a grounds up level, right, a bottoms up approach uh, within those. Uh, you know, I don't think we can depend on the names in the past which have done us really well because they are getting saturated, probably we'll see 
some of them also getting disrupted right so uh, i mean today i'm just saying whether it's paints whether you know uh, any other thing you're seeing so many players entering uh, building materials is another place that i think uh, will do very well in a in a phase that sort of uh, india grows so i think that's that's broadly you know uh, our perspective and you know what we think are the sectors which will do well sure so anil year 2020 and 2021 saw launch of many ipos many interesting businesses like paytm nika zomato right um what do you think can any one of these be the multi baggers over the next 10 years what are your views on this you know first of all the disclaimer is that you know we don't we have not invested in any of these businesses okay um and i'll tell you what got us uncomfortable right is that the valuations okay so so uh, we have a, a structured framework and when we look at uh, you know various uh, financial parameters as well as valuations right and and um, you know even we almost do a ranking of companies which come into our screen and stuff like that so so when we look at it you know uh, clearly because of valuation and other factors also if you see a number of them were not necessarily you know in great robust uh net profit margins and stuff right so so many of them sort of ran ahead uh with low profits you know with the uh expectation that you know they will grow much much faster and and those businesses are something that uh you know either you have to get early into them and uh, probably if you go back and see i think the private equity funds that invested into them earlier i think they have made a lot of money around them okay while you know some of them exited uh, you know at the ipo uh, so 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 i think it's about how do you look at at what point you know stock also comes to uh, ipo uh, i think by that time they were already discovered right so now what has happened in the recent time is uh, these companies have sort of corrected and corrected sharply okay uh, some of the euphoria that was there around that period of the ipos i think that's also uh, dissipated and i think probably gone okay uh, and and so now i think we have a little bit of a reality uh, check uh, however i i don't think at this point we are still ready to invest in them i think when we find a combination of you know financial parameters and metrics being robust when i see uh, earnings growth visibility and, and that's very very important for us okay and we are able to see a good earnings growth visibility because let's say if i want a 26% return right i cannot invest in a company growing at say 10 or 15% in terms of profit growth and expect to get uh, you know uh, share price growth of uh, 25% unless you know there are other factors like it's it's just got discovered or there's a re-rating and stuff like that but i would not go for you know stocks on that basis so so i think right now uh, not as positive on them okay but i think some of them will emerge you probably find your companies who come in at a stage now that things are you know rational you probably will find ones which come at a better valuation and maybe some hopefully some new names sort of come in but in the past i will i will wait for some more time before one starts looking at that sure arirudh what are your what what's your take on this do you think your quant style of investing will throw up certain um, you know certain certain uh, thoughts to kind of add these stocks in your portfolio okay uh, so see we are talking about four companies zomato nike paytm and policy bazaar so i am a consumer of three zomato policy bazaar i am a customer of three zomato policy bazaar and paytm but only two of them make money through me so zomato and policy bazaar so i analyzed made money through me in the last one year but that does not mean that i am an investor in any of them i primarily feel that their launch at uh, such an exorbitant prices i think with the price correction the euphoria and the price is down but it needs to be a time correction going two years down the line how the business model plays up we have to check the management also the managements they play up uh, i think money was provided to zato for zomato not for blinkit uh, so things like this but how good the and efficient the managements are and uh, what are the decisions they take and whose decisions play up? i think we need some more time Uh, before these stocks can really enter our zone of considering them because of their exuberant prices at which they were launched we generally do not consider these companies for the next 4 to 5 years sure so moving on to dheeraj dheeraj i have my uh, next question to you um 
which largely talks about generating because our topic is major, majorly on 10x in 10 years. So investing for a period of 10 years is it is I mean the journey is never a linear equation right because investing in equities is never linear and I've seen investors behaving differently during the different market times they are unable to ride through the vol volatility during the market peaks and throws I mean I've seen them you know getting you know in the most panic situations as well that when markets have corrected especially if I talk about the March 2020 hmm. period so what do you think are you know what do you think should be the right investing behavior of investors to achieve 10 10 times over 10 years so very good question ritika uh, i think the investment journey um, can have hiccups through temporary issues in business cycles or market sentiments that will continue to test in conviction of the investor what is required is an element of patience one should avoid impulsive or emotional decisions based on market volatility and stick to investment strategy even during market downturns. Um, as they say, time in the market is more important than timing the market, except if one is investing in cyclical businesses or stocks where timing is important. Also, the world is full of things that you don't have to necessarily own. So one needs to be selective. We saw what happened in the euphoric times of new age businesses being launched at one lakh crore market cap, which was exotic and uh, and obviously a lot of money was lost uh, in those cases. Besides, one also needs to avoid speculation. Don't be swayed by market rumors or try to predict short-term market movements. Instead, one should be prepared to take advantage of short-term pessimism or disappointment. Downward volatility usually can make one nervous, but otherwise it is quite harmless. You must have the courage of your conviction and be prepared to buy when other people are selling and vice versa. Uh, humility is another important part of stock market investing as it is easy to get carried away with your success. Uh, so what is required is patience, self-confidence, humility, independent thinking, open-mindedness, control of emotions and passion. I mean, these are all essential behavioral elements of successful investing. Sure. Anil, would you like to add anything to it? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, a very important factor, you know, for investors is to uh, look at their own investing behavior, right? And and many a times, of course, I also wear a wealth management hat as well. Okay, so uh, so that is something which what we see a lot of the time. I think investors uh, miss out on actually making the return yeah, returns because of certain behavioral, you know, traits of their own. Okay, and uh, and that is something that I think you know people need to start uh, working on. The first is you know especially if in a context like this, right, where you're saying, okay, I want to achieve a 10x return, right? Then you first of all, there's no question about it. You have to look at long term. Now the question is how many of our investors are willing to look at say 10 years, right? So so I if, so that's the first, and that to 10 years maybe into say one particular fund because if you keep moving them around it's not necessarily also going to help you out so 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 the so the first aspect that i'm saying is you know to understand oneself uh, understand your objectives and if you are able to you know look at a 10 year period then you know you sort of uh, look at something like this the second part of it is about you know patience and and that's also i think what dheeraj has said patience is very very important especially when you're looking at say a small cap stocks right because there could be periods where you know they do nothing you know uh, especially you know while you are trying to get stocks before they are discovered right and suddenly you know they will unlock and you may just find them run up and you know give um, a multiplier return in a very very short period of time right so so the the so patience is one the second is about i think the behavior of you know how do you handle risk how do you handle volatility right uh, is a question of fear and greed and and if you are able to keep those under control, so I think then you will actually end up seeing returns. So to me, that's a simple recipe for any investor. If you are able to over, overcome fear and greed, you will do very well in markets, right? So so that's the, that's the second part. And and I think let me give maybe a simple tip that what one can do, you know, uh, on you know market falls. I think take sufficient care. If you've taken sufficient care uh, while having invested, you know, in a fund manager and a fund. Then I think you need to let it go. You you need to probably just sleep over it. You know, if it's down uh, pretty much, then even though it's difficult, I think you need to leave it at probably just as much as you would. You know, not do anything with 
real estate when it's down, right? And the the other one is also you know about you know when uh, it's underperforming versus the benchmark, right? At not all points you want to see it performing versus the benchmark. There may be periods where it underperforms, and you know you give that time as well because as stocks get discovered, as they get reviated, you know they will do well. So I think those are the maybe two three uh, suggestions that I have on the behavioral side for investors. Sure, thank you. Uh, Anirudh, would you like to quickly add something more to it? You think that uh, that is relevant for the mm -hmm. investors out there? Yeah, I think there are three or four uh, or five styles out there, whether it is value or is it change-based, quality, special situations. An investor must choose this style. That suits his psychology. Analyze it through various pre-peaks and traps, how that style must have suited him. Once he knows that this is my style, just stick to it. As Anil sir said, as Deerat sir said, choose your style, stick to it, do not change your style, do not change your fund managers in between, do not change your mutual funds, do not change your SIPs in between. Just choose your style and stay with it. This opportunity that India is presenting in the next 10 years, where it started in 2020 from a true trillion dollar economy and going to the five trillion dollar economy, is the best time to be in the stock market. So the main thing is you have to be on the pitch, whether it is whether you want to follow Dravid or you want to follow uh, Sehwag. It's your choice, but be on the pitch. I, have a, uh, I think one thing comes to my mind when I think about uh, how investing should be done, and it's more in an informal way. So what I would like to add is like, uh, there's a song from uh, the movie Swades, so which says, you hi chala chal investor, you hi chala chal investor. Badi opportunity hai ye India. Bhool sari corrections, ignore sari distractions. Badi opportunity hai India. Just keep invested and stay there. That return will surely come. Wow, I think that was the best response. Thank you. Thank you, Anirudh. My last question of the session to Dheeraj, uh, you know, before we kind of wind up the session. Dheeraj, what do you think? Is it possible to make 10x return at a portfolio level over a 10-year period? Or you think this is just a wishful or an impractical, impractical statement? The reason why I'm asking you this question is because your portfolio is more inclined towards small and micro-cap, mid-small micro-caps, right? Um, so please, if you can throw some light uh, quickly, last two, three minutes, please. Yeah, of course, Ritika. I mean, it is possible to have a 24, 25% CAGR uh, and that is where you'll ultimately reach the destination of eight to 10 times over the next uh, 10 years or so. And as I mentioned, it is not going to be the popular stocks. The popular stocks will be popular returns. Is the dabbling into or is staying invested into the course of unpopular companies, smaller companies, provided they have the basic hygiene of management, business, and valuation uh, being reasonable, then obviously these, uh, this kind of target is very much achievable, especially when you're talking about a country like India, which is a growing economy and relatively much better growth economy than the rest of the world. Sure, sure. Thanks. So thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you, uh, three of you today, you know, for such an enlightening and insightful session. Over to you, Akriti. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there were some very noteworthy points made during this discussion. Thank you so much, Ms. Farmer and our esteemed panelists. There was a lot to learn over here.